This morning in our Beitei News service, we already started learning about Pinchas from the end of Parshat Balak. So what we're going to do this afternoon, this evening, is study Pinchas's consequences, the consequences that he faces because of what it was that he did at the instruction of Moshe, but more importantly, what he chose to complete and what he did in acting zealously and alone. And I'd like for us to start from a place of not being sure if the consequences for what he did were exactly a reward. Was he rewarded for what it was that he did, or did he face consequences that were, what's the opposite of a reward? Not necessarily a punishment, but perhaps a condemnation of sorts from a divine plane. So we're going to start from the verses so that we can get a little context. You want you can look into the Chumash as well, but let's just look at the verses themselves to start with. We're in the book of Numbers. We're in Bamidbar in the 25th chapter, verses 10 through 12. So we have God speaking to Moses saying, Pinchas ben Elazar, this is familiar, I just read this, ben Aharon HaKohen. So Pinchas, son of Elazar, son of Aharon HaKohen. So Pinchas, and then he's, we're reminded of his lineage. He is one of the grandchildren of Aaron, who is the patriarch of the priestly class, has turned back my wrath from the Israelites. He shiv et chamati me'al b'nei Yisrael. What is meant by he turned back his, his uh, wrath? What we're told Bikano et kinati betocham, velo chiliti et bene Israel bikinati. Because he displayed his kina for me, and so I did not lean on my kina. We're going to come back to this, this untranslated word right now. I did not use my kina, my passion to wipe out the Israelites. What would have happened in the text had Pinchas not done what he did? First of all, what did he do? What did Pinchas do? He just, you can just say it. He killed two people, two people, one spear, and he killed them because ostensibly they were, they were having problematic sexual relations, possibly because of the status of the people involved, possibly because of the actions of the people involved or, or, or their prior actions. And we're told that, uh, that he was, um, that he took up the call of action to, uh, to push this back, lest a plague fall upon the people. And were the Israelites punished anyway? I mean, up to that point, yes. Actually, 24,000 people died, but, but the plague stopped. And God is explaining to us in this verse, now that we're in Pinchas, he's explain, God, is, God is explaining, but uh, God says to Moshe, um, I stopped the plague because of what Pinchas did, because Pinchas displayed this, this kina, this, this passion for me, and therefore I was able to quell my passion. And so I didn't wipe out the Israelites at that point. And then we get lachen emor. So now thus, like consequently, lachen is, is, a, is a consequential word. That's why I keep using the word consequence. Lachen emor, say to, uh, it doesn't say here, but obviously he's instructing Moshe to say to Pinchas, 
Hinan mi no ten lo et priti shalom. Behold me, I give to him my covenant, my pact of shalom. Later, when we're talking through this verse, we'll come to a, a particular way in which this verse is actually scribed in the Torah. But for now, I think we just have the context both of this story and also of the use of the basic vocabulary in it. Are we good on that so far? The way that it's written, literally how it's written in the Torah scroll, we'll come to that in a, in a little bit. But for right now, I think we know the characters in the story, what Moshe and God are doing. Yeah. 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 Hey, so the question is, is it clear who is, there are a lot of pronouns here. And so the question is like, is it maybe Moshe who is actually granting a pact of peace in this moment? It seems very clear to our commentators, though perhaps there's somebody who I missed, that this is a pact of shalom that is being granted from God. Um, and I think it's because of the construction of lachen emor that, that is a, not a, um, what's the word I'm um, looking for? It is not a unique uh, appearance. It's not a unique construction, and it's how God uh, instructs Moshe to say something on God's behalf. So I think, I think that that tells us contextually uh, that we're hearing God's promise of a pact, but you're right that just the words themselves here in place could have been, he's saying to him, a lot of he's. Yeah, um, Deborah. Right. So the the point that you're making is that it, this is resonant with that scene with with Aaron and the golden calf. And it's interesting that here we have the lineage brought up, uh, reminding us of the connection with Aaron. And later in one of our commentaries, we're going to get the connection with Nadav and Avihu as well, with with the other relatives in that family tree. So uh, there's definitely a lot of connection here with Kahuna. We're also going to dig into his role professionally as a as a decedent of Aaron and what Brit Shalom means for that inheritance. So let's move into the commentaries because there are a lot of them, and I think there's a little bit to say about each of them. So first of all, Rashi, Rashi, 11th to 13th century school of commentary, says the et Brit Shalom shetehelolif. Livrit shalom ki adam ha machazik tova the chanot lemi she osa imo tova afkan peresh lo ha kadosh baruchu shalomo tav. So it means that I give him, meaning I God give to Pinchas my brit, my covenant, so that it should be to him like a covenant of peace, just like a person who shows thankfulness and, and gratitude to somebody who has done him a kindness. So here, the Kadosh Baruch Hu, blessed be God, expressed, to, expressed shalom to Pinchas. So it was like a friendly expression of gratitude. I think this might be one of the plainest interpretations of Brit Shalom. What is a Brit Shalom? Eh, it's a thank you card from God, right? It's What's Brit Shalom? It's, it's like a it's like an expression of gratitude from God. It's a little bit un, like we don't actually get any practical understanding of the implications of the lachen. Just that it's like a thank you card from uh, from God. It's like a it's like the mayor giving you the key to the city, right? You know, it's like you're not going to use the key in in the doors, but it's it's meaningful. 
Okay, Sforno, Italian commentator, 15th century. Don't quote me on this, and now it's on YouTube. So, but no, I'm pretty sure 15th century Italian commentator. Epriti Shalom. So he says, Mi malach hamavet. He says, this is a Brit Shalom, a covenant of peace from the Malach Hamavet. What does it mean to have a covenant of peace with the angel of death? He quotes, Ose Shalom Bim Romav. Well, God is the maker of the peace in the high heavens, wherein, by the way, the Malach Hamavet is found. So what is the Brit Shalom that's being gifted? If it's a Brit Shalom, as in God is the maker of peace in the high heavens, A long life, exactly, Erev, a long life. So what's a breach shalom? A breach shalom is, apparently this is being read in the uh, in a parallel with Eov, as Sforno gets into, the, with Eov, with Job, with the, with the book of Job, which is quoted here, that similarly in the book of Job, the understanding is that a long life is the gift of shalom, that shalom is being spared is being spared from uh, from the Malach Hamavet, from the angel of death. But by the way, in the book of Job, being spared from death, is that being entirely spared from pain and sadness? Absolutely not. Okay, and I want us to keep that in mind as we're looking at the other commentaries, because I think that context is very important. Right? You, sir, are now personally, you individually have been given the breach shalom. You've been given a, a, the monopoly card, like you can turn this in with the, you know, what, what's that from the chance pile? The, you can turn it in, you can give it to the Malachamava, you can say, God said, you got some more time, okay? Um, but that's just personally, that might not spare you from all sorts of human foibles. Anybody want to add something, ask something on this before we move to the next commentary? Okay, was that what you were going to say, AJ? Uh-huh. <laughs> okay, so so a AJ is already writing in in her mind the the um the historical fiction novel in which Pinchas is the name of our of our Civil War <laughs> hero um slash slash complicated antagonist, depending on how she writes the book. Um, by the way, sometime we should talk about how my grandfather grew up in Petersburg, Virginia, where some of his teachers, because he was born in 1915, some of his teachers had had grown up like th through the war there. Um, yeah, but go ahead. Yeah. So here we're, we're simply translating that kof, or some people call it kuf, nun aleph, as passion, okay, as, as passion, as a simple translation. What I was noting is that later we're going to read a more playful translation from a different commentary. Actually, it's a, it's a rabbinic text that has a story that uses this in a more playful way, but it's just the direct translation of, of that word for the moment. Um, God has passion, people have passion. So we, we get both of those in that first commentary. So we'll go to the Chizkuni. Now the Chizkuni gets a little bit practical, I think. Chizkuni says, what does Briti Shalom mean? It means that lo lira mikrove zimri vikosbi. He shouldn't be too afraid of the Krovim, the, the close relatives of the two folks whose names we just read before, the folks he, he killed. So what is he being spared from? Revenge, vengeance, right? He's, he's being protected from the fear of vengeance. Now, I, I actually, I, of all the commentaries, spoiler alert, I find this to be the most compelling read. Right, the most compelling read is, I'll tell you why I find it the most compelling read, because having God say to Moshe, amongst all of the people, right, so lachen emor, go ahead and say among all the 
people, presumably, God is granting a brit shalom to Pinchas, right? I think that the practical effect there is he's being pardoned, right? N not just being pardoned, but he's being commended for this action. And, and I think that that's the most practical take. So I'm actually kind of moved by this take. Anyone else have a, a reaction to this particular take? Does it seem similarly practical or? Um, Right. right, so Bob's bringing up that it's a, it's actually a, a very um, astute comment that, that right now in our society, when there is a an act of violence and there's a police officer involved, there is a lot of discussion about whether or not there is fear on either uh, on either end for um, for the person who is involved in the investigation for the action that took place. And so what would the impact be of sort of a statement from on high, a bot call, you know, pronouncing like they're free, right? And so the, the question is, is how, um, how would a pronouncement impact on, on that sort of a scenario? Exactly. Okay. And so now continuing with Chis Kuni, a completely, oh yeah, go ahead, Tom. Right, right. So the right, I, I like that. So with peace of mind is is actually a gift of of peace, right? It's it, that is actually the the breach shalom is like uh, I'm going to give you the knowledge that you did the right thing because perhaps you would wrestle with that otherwise the rest of your life. Yeah, yeah. And whether it's going to come back to him, right? Exactly. Yeah. That's right, we're continuing to wrestle it with it for the past 3,000 years. We aren't even sure if he did it right, and we're thousands of years in the future. <laughs> it's a good point. Uh, good, and then there's a, a, a second uh, commentary by Chizkuni, and because you know we, we eventually have to end Shabbat together, I'm gonna read this one in English for us. So the expression at Briti Shalom is to be understood as if the Torah had written at Briti, comma, Brit Shalom, as if there's an extra Brit, okay? My covenant, that is the covenant of peace. We find a similar construction to this, like Kisacha Elohim in Psalms 45, which is to be understood as if the author of that Psalm had written Kisacha Kise Elohim, your throne, that is the throne of God. And then they give another example in Joshua about Ha'aron Habrit similarly. The author says he could cite numerous such examples. An alternate interpretation of the expression briti shalom says that Pinchas had been worried that as a result of his having killed a human being, something forbidden for a priest to do, he might have to forego his status as a priest. God therefore assured him that seeing that his intention was that kina, was that passion for God, was to glorify the name of God, uh, that ho'il uh, um, this, um, so uh, he need not to fear such consequences. This will be spelled out forthwith. So the idea is that because God understood the intention behind this action, even the thing that is explicitly forbidden for a priest to do usually, because it was done l'shem shamayim, according to Chizkuni, God reached out with a brit shalom, that is a little bit more akin to what I was saying before, uh, as in a pardon, right? He's basically pardoned as a priest, such that he gets to keep that status. Alan, yeah. Good question. What do you think the implication is of the doubling of the word breed? So what would be the difference between et briti shalom and et briti brit shalom? What could that, what could the, the, what does it mean for et briti brit to add that brit, that word brit? Oh, 
what do you think would trouble that's right to, to get the specific breach shell on what do you think troubles the commentator here what's bothersome about at briti shalom so one problem could be he's just giving the covenant of peace to someone who killed someone that could be problematic sure joseph yeah Right. So that the idea being that there must be different there must be different iterations of of a breach from God because we've seen God give other covenants before and therefore this must be God clarifying which type of a covenant it is for a lot of reasons possibly because we want to be clear that God could have given a different kind of breach here, possibly because we want to be clear that when God is giving a this specific breach shalom here, it's not God re-giving the breach that, uh, wh what other breach have we seen in the Torah so far? Right, covenant between the pieces. We saw a breach with Noah, right, with a rainbow. We have lots of, of breach. So uh, we need to clarify that this is, that is the breach shalom. And so they're just, I think, bothered. I think Chisun is just bothered by the idea that briti, that is like God has, wait, what do you mean my, my breach? Hang on, didn't you already give your breach? So he's trying to say, clarifying briti, that is breach shalom. Uh, that's how I understand that comment, but you're right, it is kind of obscure. So we're going to go into Ha'emek Hadavar, which is this Hasidic commentary that's going to, uh, take us into this, into this psychology just for a moment, as is the Orchot Sadikim, about, about that killing of a person. Because remember, we were talking just a moment ago about the Chis Kunis uh, having brought up the pardon on behalf of God, saying, I, I know you killed someone, but because you killed someone for the sake of heaven, it's okay, you can stay a priest. So Ha'emek HaDavar says, Pinchas, he was promised. What was he promised? that he would not become an angry person just because of the nature of what he did. Because he killed somebody, he took a laharog nefesh biado. He took a life in his hands, and that leaves a strong impression right, on the heart. And however, since he did it for the sake of heaven, he received also the blessing that he would always be in peace and serenity. Who else did we see kill someone with their hands and did not become a person who was a person of anger? Moses. But did he have some anger problems? He did have some anger issues, right? So I actually, you know, the text doesn't bring Moshe as an example here. And I kind of, I kind of think there's a good reason not to bring Moshe as an example. I actually think that this is a very wise comment. I think he says it without saying it. Like, we know that we've seen in the Torah that killing a person with your hands, uh, maybe it changes you, right? Maybe it does make you an angry person. So it needs to be acknowledged. Yeah. Oh. And Cain and Abel as well, right? It changes who you are. Exactly. That's exactly right, Joey. Moses killed the Egyptian for beating a slave. So we're going to look at the next, uh, next source. So Moshe was jealous of the Egyptian, as it said, and he smote the Egyptian. And so we find in the case of Eliyahu, when he said, I've been very jealous, meaning the key, take a look at the Hebrew, Kanoa Kinati, right? So it's the same word. I have been very jealous for God, the God of hosts, and of Oat, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. Right? All of these words, at Britacha B'nai Israel, all of these are very resonant words. You see that? All of these are shared, shared words, even if you're not so familiar with reading the Hebrew. The Chaynemar, I see your hands in one second, Paul. Um, uh, and so God, may God be blessed, gave him his reward 
For this, as it is said, behold, I give to him my covenant of peace. What was Eliyahu's reward? Anyone remember? How is it that Eliyahu comes to visit us all these times and places? He doesn't really die. Fantastic. Hold that thought. And also, you, I know you had a thought on this too. Yeah. Uh-huh. It sure does. Jealous does seem like a strange word in the context of, of Moshe beating the Egyptian. But when we start to think about that word as a, of passion bubbling up, and that the commentators read commentators read into that moment that passion can come from a place of l'shem shemayim from a um, from a, from a, a place that's for the sake of heaven. That that's not textual. That has to be read into it, right? We don't we don't in our modern uh, sensibility we don't. That's not something that we apply to situations, right? We don't generally speaking, see uh, righteousness in killings, period. So it, it's hard for us. It's hard for us to see and to read that, even to read, even though it's a, actually, I think, a really um, uh, savvy read, right, to say, like, to go and read back that that passion into that moment. Ah, well, yeah, Moshe, right, it was passion, and so Moshe was passion in that moment. That's hard because it's hard for us to apply a connotation of uh, positivity to that moment. So AJ's hand, and then Irv, and then Bob. Yeah. That's right. Right. So how do you how do you understand when somebody is taking an action like the one that we see Pinchas take and understand that it's Lashem Shemayim, that it's for the sake of heaven? And how do you know when it's a zealot and when it's a lynching? Right? How do you know which is which? And the the problem that we have, I will name goes beyond the modern sensibility. Because it isn't just saying that we have to deal in apologetics when we're going back to read the text now. We're dealing with a fundamental problem that when we read the Torah, they are living in a reality in which they are conversant with God through their leader Moshe. So they have the benefit of consulting with the divine, right? So this is why it's so difficult because like, oh, great, no problem. I actually have an answer for you. God says, it's all good, right? And Pinchas and what do you, well, whether or not you believe literally what happened happened or not, nowadays we don't think of, uh, of the reality as one where we can consult, where we can consult the divine and get the answer to that question. And the hubris that it takes to believe that any one individual, as opposed to a system, even a broken system, but the hubris that it takes for an individual to believe that they have the answer without us, and we're all pretty much in agreement, being in a conversant relationship with the divine, that's what makes for zealotry. Right? That's me on my pulpit saying that. Like that's the that's the trouble with zealotry in a human world where we're not in conversation with the divine. So I really struggle with what you struggle with as well, because how do you find that line? And we encountered it all through history since then. Exactly. And 
and these texts themselves have been wielded for some of those sakes. Exactly. I haven't forgotten that Irv had something to say and Bob as well. Yeah. So what Irv is saying is that the, the zealotry, the, the zealotry uh, is like what, what makes for the Lashem Shemayim um, is so hard. Well, first, let me repeat the comment for those who, uh, who couldn't hear. The, the, the concept is that Pinchas gets a whole chapter because we need to understand what it means to stand up on behalf of some sort of a greater good when people are going astray. The trouble is, to just to go back to, to uh, what I was saying a moment ago, that we don't live in a reality in which we have access to that clear cut, bat kol, voice of the divine, uh, telling us what is right and what isn't right. And so we have an additional thing to wrestle with beyond what they have in the text. Uh, and I'm going to leave it at that so we can get through a few of the other commentaries. Unless, did you say something on behalf of Bob too? Or did you want to add something? <laughs> So that's interesting. So Bob says, you know, justice that you say it is for the sake of God, you know, the, and so we could call that Lashem Shemayim. The, um, the challenge is that courts are in human hands and therefore as justice is carried out, what one person's justice is another person's perversion of justice. And, and this is where we witness in our humane realm a, 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 uh, a conflict of seeing people on the one hand as, as zealots and on the other hand as heroes. God says it was just. Wouldn't it be great if God could come down and tell us if everything was just? Okay, so Rashi, um, uh, I brought Rashi back here. Uh, uh, we don't need to read the Rashi to make sense of the Avot de Rabbi Natan. It's okay. I thought we did. I take it back. I don't think we need it. We're just going to go into the Avot de Rabbi Natan. And I promise you that there is a purpose to this long story. So do people know Avot de Rabbi Natan a little bit? Do you know this story? Does anyone know about this book? Wonderful, ancient piece of Agadic literature that I love for its stories, for its collection about uh, who the rabbis were as characters. So it tells us much more um, than uh, other of the earlier works of Avot um, about the characters of each of the rabbis who are studying in the earliest schools, uh, in, in the earliest Amor Amoraic schools. So uh, I'm going to read us this story. I happen to really love this story. And it's going to take us all the way back to that first question, which AJ brought, up, ba brought us back to, which is why the kina is important. Okay. Rabbi Shimon would say there are three crowns, the crown of Torah, the crown of priesthood, the crown of kingship, and the crown of a good name is the greater than all of them. How does the crown of priesthood work? Crown of priesthood, who has the crown of priesthood? You got to be born into it, right? Including... Our friend Pinchas, right? You're a friend of mine. Okay. Oh, I barely have enough time to do this. Okay. So even if someone paid all the silver and gold in the world, we could not give him the crown of priesthood. 
Everyone knows that joke, right? As it says, it will be for him and his descendants after him an eternal covenant of priesthood for the crown of kingship as well. Even if someone paid all the silver and gold in the world, we could not give him the crown of kingship. As it says, my servant David shall be their prince for all time. But the crown of Torah is different. For anyone who wishes to partake in the work of Torah may come and partake as it says, ah, all who are thirsty go to the water. That is, go and labor in the words of Torah. Torah is often compared to water like it is here in Isaiah. That is, go and labor in words of Torah and do not occupy yourself with meaningless things. There's a story of Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai. He would regularly go and visit the sick. He once came upon someone who was bloated, had some sort of like intestinal distress, and was cursing God. Rabbi Shimon said, empty one. You should be begging for mercy, and instead you're cursing? The man said back to him, the Holy Blessed One has departed from me and rested on you. And then he said, the Holy Blessed One has done properly by me, for I have left aside words of Torah and occupied myself with meaningless things. Hold that thought for a moment. The, uh, there's a story of Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar. That is a different Rabbi Shimon. Don't get confused. <laughs> a lot of Shimons, I guess, was a popular name. It was like the Rachel of the day, you know. Um, okay, Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar. He was once coming from Migdal Eder, from his teacher's house, and he was riding on a donkey. He was traveling along the coast, and he spotted somebody who was quite ugly. He said, empty one, how ugly you are. Are all the people in your city as ugly as you? The man replied, what can I do about it? Go to the artisan, meaning God, who made me and say to God, how ugly is this vessel you made? When Rabbi Shimon realized that he had sinned, he got off his donkey and he prostrated himself before the man. And he said, I've sinned against you, forgive me. But the man replied, I will not forgive me. I will not forgive you until you go to the artisan who made me and say, how ugly is this vessel you made? Rabbi Shimon followed after him for three meal. All the people in the city came out to greet him, meaning Rabbi Shimon, and then said, peace be upon you, Rabbi. The man said, meaning the ugly man, said, who are you calling Rabbi? They said, the one who's traveling behind you. He said to them, if that is a Rabbi, may there be no more like him in Israel. They said to him, God forbid, what did he do to you? He told them such and such he did to me. They said to him, even so forgive him. He said, I hereby forgive him, but only if he does not continue to do this. On that day, Rabbi Shimon went to his great study hall and taught. A person should always be soft like a reed and not rigid like a cedar. Go over to the Hebrew for a moment and get yourself to, I wish I'd numbered the lines. Someone's going to find it before me. Um, okay, so it is, let me tell you, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 lines from the bottom. It's almost in the, the center of this paragraph, right? So it should be Adam Rach Ke. Kane, do you see it? In the middle, uh, it's the third word in on the twelfth line from the bottom. Adam rach kekane. Okay. So this, and it's it's repeated in the very last line. So he says a person should be soft like a reed and not rigid like a cedar. For the reed, when all the winds come and blow against it, moves in their direction. But the winds quiet down, the reed returns to its place. That's why the reed merited to be made into a quill that's used to write a Torah scroll. So I'll, I'll pause there. You don't need to read the rest of the section to hear that. This is meant to be a hint at Kina, the two letters, the first two letters of the word, of the word for passion. Okay, this is meant to be a, a hint at the idea of being like a reed versus being impassioned. So the reason why this story is brought as a commentary on this particular situation is because the, the difference between 
the passion that moves somebody to kill versus the reed that merits to be like the Torah, which can bend with the wind but then returns to its place, is an olive versus a hay. There's a very, very fine line between that differential. So if you're like a reed and you empty yourself, if you're not full of things, perhaps, I like that image, then you can bend when necessary and straighten when necessary to be like a reed and to be like the one who inherits Torah, not like the one who inherits priesthood. Now, I, to, to, be like, to be like the one who inherits Torah, which is merited by anyone and everyone, as opposed to the one who inherits the priesthood, who can only be inherited by means of birth and was something that had to be inherited and then kept and protected by God. And I wanna end actually on that note, which I'm like racing and rushing to do because we have almost uh, no time left to do this. I wanna share with you the last, ah, yeah, the last commentary, okay? So here's the last comment and, and how it connects. You'll see, I hope, how this connects into the idea of the reed, the Torah, and the priesthood inheritance. So Sforno says the following. Seeing that what he did, what he did in full view of his peers, so that they would obtain complete sheyichu parlahem, like that they they would obtain expiation you understand like they would be because they he did this in view in view of people said so they would be expiated for their sins okay for not having protested zimri's behavior he proved himself fit to become a priest whose primary function it is to secure expiation for the sins of their jewish brethren and as a priest he was fit forever to do this kind of yichaper ba'adam, to actually expiate for people. So, so, what did, so what did God see fit to preserve Pinchas's life for? Why was Pinchas given a breach shalom? Why was he given a pass by the Malach Hamavet? Why was he allowed to keep his position in the priesthood? Why is his inheritance not the kaneh, not the, the reed of Torah, but the kina, the passion of the priesthood, because he demonstrated that what he was good at was expiation and bloodshed. Now it's complex. I'm not saying that it's wrong, because the Torah and our commentary doesn't say that it's wrong. But he, I, I believe this complicates the idea of whether or not it was a reward that he went on to keep the priesthood. I really do. I think that the inheritance of the priesthood, the fact that he had to spend the rest of his life reliving slaughter was, was quite the condemnation, right? That was what he went on to have to live for the rest of his life was expiating on behalf of the people and of their sins. And that turned out to be what he is fit for. And that's a tough life. It's a very tough life. And I think it complicates his figure and his inheritance. There's so much more I could say and lead us into discussion on, but I have to stop us here so that we can daven mariv and end Shabbat. Um, but I'm so appreciative of this rich conversation, and I hope we can continue uh, some other time on it.